In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much, O Lord, for this uh, lovely uh, three-day period of time, O Lord, to kind of give us a taste of uh, the wonderful time that is to come in the great fast, um, to give us uh, an example of um, humility uh, in Jonah the Prophet, an example of uh, how kind and merciful and gentle God is, uh, quick to forgive and to pardon even the Ninevites who have lived a wicked life, Lord, and now uh, once they've repented, it's like you are waiting for them to repent, oh Lord, so that you can pardon. We thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness. Help us, oh Lord, to appreciate this and to honor it with how we live our life and to treat each other the same way. Be with us, Lord, in this Bible study tonight. Let it be for the glory of your name and for our edification. And make us worthy to pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Alrighty, I know last week y'all uh, covered uh, the Epistle St. Jude, and uh, we don't have uh, Rafat here with us, but uh, to go over that as a quick summary, but uh, we do need to post that online, actually, I'm sorry, I'm behind on this. Um, we'll go over what we covered uh, from the last time we did Hosea, the week before last. Last time we were, we were in chapter 2 from verses... Uh, 5 to 13, and um, I'm going to mention some of the highlights that we covered last time, as usual, and like, please, I encourage you to jump in, ask any questions, or uh, object, or challenge, or whatever, or talk about anything you want to talk about. First thing that we highlighted last time was um, that there are three th things that bother God when his children do them, um, because they are very harmful to his children. One is self-consumption. I can vouch for that. You know, being being consumed with self, my situation, what's going on in my life, <clears throat> what is happening to me, what I want, what I don't like, um, it's not good for us. Um, the second one is a sense of entitlement. Um, or being consumed with, uh, and, and being consumed with the physical only and neglecting the spiritual. Those things bother God because they're very threatening and very dangerous to our salvation. After that, we said that to pursue and to seek after your fulfillment and satiation and comfort and joy from anything other than God is to believe and to live the most common lie from the father of lies. I, I, I don't have enough fingers to tell you how many people I come across who are really miserable because they are trying to fill legitimate voids in, in their heart with other people or other things other than God. And they're wondering why. They're still not satisfied. <clears throat> um, after that, we said that God does not enjoy causing pain or suffering. He only resorts to this method uh, he only resorts to it if we ignore all his other attempts and bring us back to him in order to save us. If you ever find yourself feeling continuously unhappy or dissatisfied or unfulfilled or it's like all kinds of stuff is happening to you, this might be a good time to ask yourself if there is something that you need to repent of. If God is doing this in order to um, uh, get your attention. And uh, then we said that when the going got tough, ask yourself if God is trying to get your attention in order to get you to repent from something. I feel like even just once you start asking that question or praying it, it makes whatever difficult time you're going through already a little bit lighter. And then we asked a question. We said, do you sometimes use the gifts that God gave you to pursue after idols in your life? Um, and then we said that sometimes because, because God keeps covering us in the sight of others, 
we too end up forgetting that our our own sins and flaws and iniquities do exist and that is it is only by God's grace that he is covering us in the sight of others and 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 it gets to our head and we stop repenting or being humble which drives God to expose us a little bit to expose us a little bit to others and more importantly to ourselves so that we would feel ashamed a little bit or humbled a little bit and repent and return to him. Again, it's only for the purpose of us repenting and returning back to him for the purpose of saving us. It's not for a per for the purpose of simply causing us pain or rubbing our nose in it, if you want. Um, <clears throat> and then um, we said that it is not vengeance or retaliation for the purposes of causing pain. It is punishment and pain for the purpose of causing awakening and repentance and returning to God. For the purpose of causing salvation. We said Hebrews 12, 6, it says, For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, he chastises, and he punishes Hello? every son whom he accepts. Um, that that was when we were going back about like some people who have a hard time saying that God punishes, and we said that it's it really has to do with what we look at the purpose of punishing is, um. And then we said, um. If people are celebrating major feasts of the Lord in lewd ways that are against God's commandments, he declares he's looking at them excuse me, as feasts for them. He will not accept them as feasts for him. How can we be celebrating God in a way that dishonors him? So then we're not really honoring him. And then we said that if people do not remove lewdness and sin from their feasts and celebrations, then God will remove the mirth and enjoyment from their lewdness and sin. Um, so even the, they'll keep doing the lewdness and sin, but it will not hit the spot. It will not satisfy. It be very frustrating, actually. And then we recalled the, uh, the quote by St. Augustine where he said that God who created you without you cannot save you without you. You need to co-labor with God. You need to work. You need to do your part so that give God something to work with so he can save you. And then lastly, we said that uh, why do people tend to remember God in times of needs and difficulties and sufferings, but tend to forget God in times of plenty and joy and success? Not all people, of course. Um but imagine people who do this, what are they telling God? They're telling God, please keep the times of difficulties and needs and sufferings coming because these are the only times I connect with you. Because God wants our salvation. So that's what we're communicating to him. If we connect with God during times of plenty and times of joy and success, then he'll have no need to resort to the other stuff. And that's kind of a quick um, summary of the highlights that we covered last time in Hosea chapter 2 from verse 5 to 13. Um, does have any, anybody have any questions or comments or anything before we continue? <clears throat> All righty. Now, we saw before we start reading here, like until now, God has been using harsh words and talking harshly. And now we're going to see how sweet the Lord is, even though she forgot me. But before that, let's let's maybe read a... If you recall, I want to read for you, actually, verses 1 through, through 13. And um, then we can have somebody read from 14 onward. Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Bring charges against your mother, bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. 
Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy on her children, for they are the children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot, she who conceived them as has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. She, yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband. For then it was better for me than now. <clears throat> like the prodigal son. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, all her joy, all her enjoyment, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees of which she has said, these are my wages that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest and the beasts of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of the bowels to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me, she forgot, says the Lord. And that's where we stopped last time. So you can sense the, 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 the harshness of the words and it ends with, but me, she forgot, says the Lord. So now let's continue and read from verse 14 through 23. <clears throat> um, let's see who is with Helen. Would you read for us, please, from verse 14 through 23? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Therefore, behold, I will. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. Will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there, and the valley of Acre as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. For I will take from her mouth the names of the ba Baals, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day I will make a co co uh, co covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow, bow and sword of battle, battle I will shatter from the earth, to make them lay down, lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I'll betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. It shall come to pass in the day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new vine and with oil, they shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they shall say you are my God. Glory be to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever and unto the ages of all ages. I mean, thank you. Did y'all notice the change? Let's let's go over this um, together one by one. So remember all the harsh words and how verse 13 it ends, but me, she forgot, says the Lord. There's like this, this sadness, heaviness, 
anger, if you will. So she betrays me. She mocks me. She insults me. She disrespects me. The stuff I give her, she takes and she uses for idols. She even forgot me. Therefore, remember we said, what? Well, there's another one of those therefores. So you'd expect the wrath of God to come upon her. Like, therefore, I'm going to hit her on the head with a stick. But look at what he says. Our God, this, this amazing Lord. Therefore, therefore what, Lord? Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. What? You know what I will allure her means? It means I will attract her. I will appeal to her. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Okay, what does it mean? I will bring her into the wilderness. First of all, I will take her to a place of quietness, a place with no noise and distractions. Exactly like what he did with the prodigal son. By the way, it wasn't... Yeah, I need to say this carefully. In my opinion, it wasn't just the pain that caused the prodigal son to come back to himself. It was the silence. Because... He has, he has been experiencing pain as his friends would leave him one by one and then he'd find nobody is having mercy on him and then he got kicked out. All this stuff is pain. But there was still stuff happening. But it was the silence, the quietness. Finally, all the noise of the parties and the so-called friends and activities, etc. It's all gone. Do you remember Isaiah 30, 15? We quote that verse every once in a while. And boy, do we need it these days. Isaiah 30, 15. We remember it because 15 is half of 30. It says what? For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. It is imperative. It's very, very important that, that we intentionally take time to be silent, take time with no distractions. What's funny is that how now people have become so accustomed to noise continuously that they become very uncomfortable with, with silence. Like they got to have, you know, music in the radio or, like, or, or something or on the phone. And then they walk in the house, they flip on the TV and have stuff playing in the background. And um, People get very uncomfortable with, with noise and silence. Why? Because it causes us to start thinking and to start uh, introspecting. So we're not, too, we're not too fond of that. Even though that that's what we need in order to return, in order to repent, in order to have confidence and strength. So remember that. So he said, I will allure her. And what else does he do? I will bring her into the wilderness, mean... It also means um, remember who God is talking to here. When he says, I will bring her into the wilderness. He's talking to the people of Israel. And what does the wilderness have to do with the Israelites? Why did God say, I will bring her to the wilderness? Especially talking to the people of Israel. What do you all think? To start, to, to start new new life. No. Or not to be surrounded by people, Yani. But that was the thing that we talked about at first, in quietness and silence, no distractions. Yeah. But why else? Like, why didn't he say, I'll, I will bring you into a garden, I will bring you into a, um, a quiet place? Why did he use wilderness? What happened to the people of Israel in the wilderness? It is, it is to remind them what he did for them in the wilderness. To remind her of all that he had done for her in the wilderness. How he got her out of slavery and bondage into the freedom of the wilderness. How he covered her with the cloud 
and lit the way for her with the pillar of fire at night, how he provided the manna for her and how he always provided water for her in the wilderness, how he split open the rock and how he split open the Red Sea and the Jordan River, how he even kept her shoes and clothes and stuff from breaking or, or wearing out for 40 years in the wilderness. And how he did this for 40 years. 40 means 4 times 10. You remember, uh, uh, well, actually, when, when you look at the number 40, it is repeated quite a bit in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, right? Like Moses was 40 when he started his ministry, but God took him out and he had him uh, go through uh, three servants for 40 years. And then he came and did his service for 40 uh, years. Um, uh, Moses was on the mountain getting the tablets for 40 days. Uh, Moses fasted 40 days. Elijah fasted 40 days. Our Lord Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days. Um Even the 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 fast, like we say, forty days and forty nights. What is the significance of the number forty? Or four times ten? What does four refer to? Earth, to the world. To the world. And north, east, yeah. Yeah, the four corners of the world, the four seasons: uh, north, east, southwest, um, spring, fall. Uh, winter, summer, etc. So, uh, four complete uh, refers to uh, the world, okay, and or or like life on earth. And ten is a complete number. So forty is a symbol of a complete lifetime on earth. So when when it says that God he did all this stuff for them in the wilderness how he provided for them how he gave them freedom into the wilderness how he covered them and led the way for them how he gave them the men and water and how he protected their shoes and clothes for 40 years that means for a whole lifetime so at the risk of beating a horse to death if you haven't done it yet Please, please, please make a journal of milestones of all that God has done for you in your life so far, in your 40 years, quote unquote, so far. And keep record of such events moving forward, please. Why, why is it that in, in silence and rest and returning and quietness is your salvation and is your strength and is your confidence because it is during that time that we can go back and recall how God has been so attentive and so involved and so intentional, so purposeful like in our life so far. So please... Uh, do that. Maybe that's an exercise you can work on during the great fast. I recall way back before the priesthood, uh, <laughs> um, back when we had a VCR. Anybody here remember what a VCR is? <laughs> Probably the younger generation not so much. but um, I don't know how this ended up happening. It wasn't like an intentional thing, but about once a year, Missy and I will... Uh, get our wedding video tape and we would put it in the machine and we would play it. The ceremony, the reception and everything. And it was just, was weird. Like it was so lovely to remember how much, you know, we love each other and how young we were and, and, and how stupid we were and how God has carried us and covered us you know, all this year until now, and like how we knew nothing and look, and somehow we're here, we survived, and like, you know, we made it, and the kids are still alive, and like, you know, and just the journey of life that we have gone through together. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a VCR anymore, so <laughs> we need to somehow convert that to something uh, digital or 
or uh, if the tape itself is intact and it didn't like melt or stick to itself. It's been so long. Anyway, um, remember those days. Do do yourself a favor and record the stuff. So God is saying here, I yeah. After all this harsh stuff, I will attract her and appeal to her and bring her to the place that has no distractions and also the place where I did all these wonderful things to her, and I will speak comfort to her. Oh my gosh, how amazing is the Lord. It's, it's mind-boggling. It's like after how nasty and betraying and selfish and entitled and, and, and she has been and how she forgot him. And he says, I will speak comfort to her. It's crazy. And not only that, but look, verse 15. <clears throat> I will give her her vineyards from there. From there? From where? I will give her her vineyards from there. From that quiet place with no distractions. Where she will remember how well I loved her. And the lifetime journey that we've been through together. And remember how in verse 12 he said, I will destroy her vines. See, let me see verse 12. Right there. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees. Well, in place of her vines, he says, I will give her her vineyards from there. What's the difference between vines and vineyards? It's many, many multiples. One vineyard. It's it. at, huh? It, it's pro. Like that was just one thing. He's going to give her more. Yes, exactly. Multiples of multiples. So like one vineyard has many vines. Okay. But now he's saying I'm going to give her her vineyards, plural. So in place of her vine, I will give her her vineyards from there. Many, many multiples. And as you know, many vineyards means lots of what? what lots of get? production. Lots of produce. Produce, we get produce from vineyards. Lots of grapes. Grapes, which means lots of wine. Wine. And as we've studied many times before, wine is a symbol of joy and love. You read that in Song of Solomon's. You read that um, the first miracle that our Lord did at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. It wasn't coincidence that it was that. It's like changing the water into wine, something that is tasteless and orderless and colorless. I will change it into something beautiful and and that um, full of that brings uh, merriment and joy and love. Um, okay, so I will take her back in memory and remind her of all the lovely memories that we had together. You see how God, like, he just does not give up on us. As long as we're breathing, he's just going to keep after us. But nicely, sweetly, not forcefully. So a reminder of all the lovely memories we had together. Okay, what about the bad, bitter memories, oh Lord? Because there was some bad ones in the wilderness too, right? What about those? Those, he says, I will give her her vineyards from there. And the valley of Ahur as a door of hope. She shall sing, she, she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. What is this valley of Ahur? Does anyone remember what happened in the valley of Ahur? Something really sad and 
kind of terrifying and scary happen in the Valley of Akur. Don't be looking it up now. <laughs> Does anybody remember um, Achan, the Carmelite? Yes, 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 yes. Very good. And um, uh, Achan, the Carmelite, who after the defeat of Jericho, after uh, the people of Israel went around Jericho and, and, you know, destroyed the biggest, baddest city in the whole area, um, God told them don't touch any of that stuff because it's accursed. And Achan found a wedge of gold and a garment and, you know, he was tempted and he fell. And and he took them and he hid them. Even though the Lord told them, like, this stuff has occurred. Don't touch it. Don't even bring it in your midst. Don't let it come in between you. He took them. And um, then, like, they went through this laughable, shameful defeat by a tiny village called Ai. And then they ended up stoning Achan and all that belonged to him. And where did they stone him? In the valley of Akhor. In the valley of Akhor. That's where they, they put them all and they 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 stoned him and all his people and all his family and all his stuff. And after they stoned them, they even lit that on fire. Like it was just not good. Akhor means distress. Akhor means distress. So, even the painful memories in the wilderness, even the times of distress, I will convert those to a door of hope. See that? And the valley of Akor as a door of hope. Um, like someone who, who was entrapped in the dark valley of distress and all of a sudden a door opens a door opens up and they see the door that is full of hope to the light to the freedom and the joy the love and tenderness and grace of god are truly mind-boggling and overwhelming if a person contemplates on them they're like they just it don't make sense how how sweet and gentle and kind and, and continuously pursuing and alluring God is. But in order for the value of distress to turn into a door of hope, what must happen? What must happen? Imagine, kid, if somebody's going through the valley of a core, and a time of distress in their life. In order for them to have a, a door of hope towards the light, what must happen? They should remember God and call on Him. Okay. We call on God all the time in times of distress, but there's something we don't tend to remember to do. So what is the thing I'm talking about? Although we did hint towards it or mention it a couple of times in the in the summary from last Bible study. In order for the value of distress to turn into a door of hope, there had to be repentance. The removal of sin. Aiken the Carmelite was the symbol of sin in their midst. So once he was removed and buried in that valley of distress, the valley of a core, then the door of hope opened up again. And they went on conquering and dwelling in the land of milk and honey that God promised them. I will not get to experience the promised land if I hold on to the sin in my midst, around me. Because um, there's there's people, y'all, that, that are in the valley of distress, but they still don't let go of sin. 
and then they're mad because the the value of the stress is ongoing. By the way, the value of Akor is now called Ain Gedi. You know what Ain Gedi means? Ain means spring, like a spring of water. Gedi, like the kid, as in the kid of a goat, the little goat. And the value of Akor is now the value of Ain Gedi, which is now a very fertile and plush oasis. It's interesting to, to know that. Okay. And what else? It says, she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. So just like after crossing the Red Sea, how Miriam took the temple in her hand and all the people were singing with her in one voice, let us sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. Um, by the way, chanting the midnight praises is a way for us to go back and recall how sweet the Lord is and all that he has done and continues to do for us in the value of a core, in the value of distress. And how he, 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 even though we deserve to be hit on the head with a stick, he keeps alluring us and he keeps pursuing us in order to give us a door of hope from the value of distress in our life. Um, the midnight praises are not just to go chant some lovely songs or, or hymns, but it's to recall yani, God's journey with men and to really walk out with hope. Uh, verse 16 is lovely. Look at this. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord. As soon as you read the word in that day, right away, your mind, sh your mind should go to to when that day. Anybody there? Am I talking to myself? Or late? That day, the end of the world? Yes. To the second coming. Whenever you read the words in that day, right away your mind should go to the second coming. So... In that day, in the day you remove the sin from among you, is just absolutely beautiful. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. What's another word for master? <clears throat> This is going to be hard. Whoever gets this will get a candy or something. I don't know. Nope, not Lord. I mean, it, that's true, but that's not the word we're, we're looking for. Teacher? Teacher? Close. No. It's funny because actually in Arabic... That's another word for husband. Baal. Baal is another word for master. Remember how the God was called Baal? Um, he's saying, I don't want her to even remember that word master anymore. Why, Lord? Look at verse 17. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. Because even the word Baal is related to those idols. She will be remembered by my name. So what is he saying here? While God is still our master, he wants us to look at him as our husband, as our bridegroom. What is the difference between the master and the husband? Abu Nasara used to, I mean, Nasara used to call Abraham master, right? She used to call him my lord. 
Yes, I eat. Okay. What is the difference between the master and the husband? Master is obligation and husband. Partner and boss. In the headphones. I don't know. Oh, uh, partner and boss. Okay. Yes, you're getting it. If you were to say the difference between master and husband in one word, what would it be? Whatever is coming to my mind right now is boundary. No, you can have boundaries with a master and with a husband. The one word that is the difference is love. Is it intimacy? Intimacy, yeah, close. Love. Abuna, I love. said love, but it was on mute. Tai, get off. Very good. There it is again, verse 18. In that day. So again, even though he is our master, he wants us to look at him as our husband. Now, as we are as the bride, and he's the bridegroom, the bride still yeah, and he submits to her husband and honors him and lifts him up and all that stuff. But he wants us to look at him more as a husband as opposed to a master. And then in verse 18, he says it again. In that day, in that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field with the birds of the air and with the creeping things of the ground, bow and sword of battle, I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. When there is peace between the person and God, between the individual and God, automatically there will be peace between the person and nature and creation, and other people too, automatically. Even with the beasts and the birds and creeping things. And we've actually seen literal examples of this. For example, like um, uh, St. Macarius uh, with, with the, and the hyena. He had a, he had a hyena friend, <laughs> Um, and we know how terrible hyenas are. Yeah. Or St. Barsoom al and St. Barsoom the naked with the serpent that he used to lay his head on as a pillow. Or or St. Mark with the lion. That's why we always see St. Mark with the lion. Or um, St. Anna Simone. St. Anna Simone, she was like with various beasts. And also, guess what? We read this in uh, in Revelation, how the lion and the lamb are laying together next to each other in peace. In peace. So when he says to make them lie down safely, this reminds me of Psalm 126 too. I quote this verse a lot here at home. It says, he gives his beloved sleep. Or he gives sleep to his beloved. Who are his beloved? The ones whom he loves? He gives sleep to his beloved. So who are his beloved? The ones whom he loves? All of us? It's a good guess, but no, that's not it. It's not the ones whom he loves. His well, children. Love him. His well, his Michael, children. Michael's got it. We are all his children. He loves us all, but yet some of us sleep really well and some of us don't. So what does that mean? He gives sleep to his beloved means no. He gives sleep to the ones who love him. As in the ones who keep his commandments. When he said, if you, those who love me, keep, keep my commandments. Or if you love me, keep my commandments. Those who live according to his will, they will sleep. The one who is at peace with God will have peace with creation, 
we'll have peace with nature, we'll have peace with other people, and we'll have peace with themselves. If, I'm just going to put this out there, if you are a person who is not at peace with himself or with herself, I strongly recommend you check your relationship with God if you are at peace with God. And where will this amazing peace come from? Look at the most beautiful verses, verses 19 and 20. He says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. He said in this in this sentence here, in this it's two verses, but it's one sentence. He says, I will betroth you to me um, three times. Okay, something interesting here. Why did he say betrothed? Why didn't he say, I will marry you three times? Are we going to stay only betrothed, O Lord? Are we ever going to get married as in united? I mean, that would be a disaster for us, right? But then he says, I will betroth you to me a forever. Why? Betrothal and uh, or 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 engagement is based on two important things. Love and choice love and choice <laughs> engaged couples stay with each other because they love each other and because they still want or still choose each other there's no obligation here there's no promise, Abuna? There is promise, but mm -hmm. it's a period of engagement, which means um, we're not uh, um, tied together. We're not tethered together. We're not bound together. It is it is uh, like a free will. It's, there, there's love there, and there's choice. And the period of engagement is a period of like the most like infatuation where the couple are like consumed with each other and have each other on each other's mind, like always thinking about each other. Does, does this remind you of any verse or passage? This initial infatuation or passion? Song of Songs. Okay. Excuse me, Abuna, before you go into the verse, mm -hmm. isn't isn't this imposing a current understanding of like engagement onto the like ancient practice when there really wasn't an engagement and people didn't marry because of love, like the kind of love that we understand? I don't understand the question. Like people, there were, there were arranged marriages. People didn't pick each other like we pick each other. Their families picked the spouses and then they were betrothed to them and then they made it work. So is it fair to put our understanding of things the way that we currently practice it? Well, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like yeah. that all the time. For example, look at uh, Isaac and Rebecca. So like Eliezer, the the servant of uh, Isaac, you know, like he'd uh, 
he asked God to guide him, him and to help him, and he picked Rebecca. But when they saw each other, there was like stars. And until okay. they got married, um, there was that period of um, uh, infatuation and excitement. No, and by the way, even the, the period of betrothal, it can be broken, even back then. A period of being consumed with, with the lover, being like waiting, uh, yearning. Okay. Thank you. This, sure, this, this, um, actually reminds us of like you know to 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 kind of go back to the betrothed state it reminds me of revelation uh, chapter 2 verses 2 to 4 what the lord said to the angel of the church of ephesus in the, in the first part in verses 2 to 3 it's it's like the marriage part he says uh this is revelation 2 2 he says what i know your works your labors your patience that you cannot bear those who are evil that you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and had have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. This is marriage. <laughs> Labor and perseverance and works and patience and to do what's right and to hang in there and, and, and have patience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then he says what in verse 4? So we read Revelations 2, 2 and 3. Do you remember what he told the church of Ephesus or the angel of the church of Ephesus in verse 4? He said, nevertheless, hmm, I have this against you. What? That you have left your first love. You, you, you have left or forgotten that initial state of excitement, that initial state of being betrothed to each other. Um, also, Missy, I need to address what you're saying is that yeah, even back then, when, when, when a young couple is going to be like betrothed to each other because the families or the elders uh, know each other and love each other and the families are good together and stuff like that and so they arranged for all this because these people still love their son or love their daughter so there's still a huge amount of excitement you know because because wrote this in our hearts so like you know these people want to get married and stuff so they're excited about it anyway so god is saying here that this state of infatuation, this state of excitement and passion will remain continuous forever. That's what, that's what he's saying is, I will betroth you to me forever. God desires for us to stay in this betrothed to him forever for, for eternity. And as, as far as he's concerned, he will remain in this state forever. It's now our turn to choose to remain betrothed to him ourselves. And then it, it continues. Look at this. He says, a, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy and faithfulness. We are unrighteous, but God is betrothing us to himself to make us righteous. We are unjust, but God is betrothing us to himself to make us just and to live in justice. God doesn't betroth us to himself because we deserve it, because we are good, but because he is good. That's why he is betrothing us to himself, or, or his betrothing us to himself is an act of loving kindness and mercy from him towards us. I mean, y'all, okay, let's let this soak in a little bit. You saw the first half of this chapter, how she's terrible and bad and forgetful and keeps going to my lovers and my stuff and my this and completely forgot him, right? And the gifts he gave her, she goes and offers to Ba. 
and and yet he pursues her and betrothes her to himself and and says all these sweet things to her. Just just remember this. God does not love us because we are good. He loves us because he is good. And and he betrothes us to himself when we are unrighteous, when we are unjust, in order to make us live in righteousness and justice. And he does this as an act of loving kindness and mercy from him towards us. And then he is betrothing us to himself, to himself in faithfulness. Whether we deserve it or not, he will remain faithful. Even when we are faithless like Gomer. Does this sound like a verse? Do you remember this verse? How even when we are faithless, God will remain faithful. This is in uh, 2 Timothy. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2.13. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Tell you his love makes no sense. <laughs> is that's how he feels about us? And why? Why is why is God doing all this and accepting this very unfair bargain, or deal, or ridiculous transaction? He declares his goal now. He declares his why. What does he say? It's at the end of verse twenty. And you shall know the Lord. How else are we going to know him? It's when we deserve, we're, we know we're terrible, we know we're betrayful, we know we're selfish, we know we're entitled, we know we, we, we call all these other things our lovers, even though everything is, every good gift is from him, and we take the gifts he gives us and we use them for our idols and all that stuff, but when he treats us like this according to his loving kindness and mercy and justice, then hopefully we'll really begin to know the Lord. The only result of our beginning to understand a small fraction of God's infinite love for us is that we begin to know him. And as we know him, this will lead to everything else. As we know him, this will lead to us knowing more of how far we are from what he deserves and how much better he deserves. And now this will lead us will lead us to sincere repentance. And this will cause us to hunger and thirst more for him, which will make us receive more of his mercy and will in turn make us merciful and loving like him. And will make us unable to keep quiet about how awesome he is. It all begins with our knowing more of God. Maybe that can be a goal to work on during the great fast, is to know more of God, who he is and how he thinks and how he views us and how he deals with us. One of the most frustrating things a person to a person is when their spouse doesn't get them, doesn't know them, doesn't understand them especially after being married for so many years. Do you all remember when our Lord Jesus Christ was praying that long prayer in John 15, 16, and 17? He said that something is eternal life. Do you remember what he said? He said, and this is eternal life. What is eternal life, Lord? Who remembers? They know you. Yes. Very good. John 17, 3. He said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you. That's God's desire for us. And as a result of this knowing more of God, all kinds of awesome things follow. Look at verse 21. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. When a person begins to grow in their knowing 
God, they will begin to also truly enjoy um, and have mirth in their life, real mirth in their life on earth and and of course in their life in heaven too. And we'll go to verse 22. It says, The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, with oil. They shall answer Jezreel. The grain and wine and oil and everything becomes new. Does this sound familiar? Because remember now, we're reading all this stuff where it says, in that day. Okay? Making things new. Where do we read that? In Revelation 21.5, near the very end of the story, it says, Behold, I make everything new. And then what happens, Lord? And then, this is so sweet, he changes the three names. He changes the three names. Remember that? It says, Then I will sow her for myself in the earth. And I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. So the first one, he says what? I will sow her for myself in the earth. Meaning he changed the name. He changed Jezreel to Jezreel, right? He said he changed the bat Yazrael, the scatter. And he'll change that. That becomes the good comfort in Jezreel. Yazra'il, to plant. Okay? And I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. I will have mercy, I will have rahma on lo rahma. And I will say to lo ammi, you know, I will say to you are not my people, you are my people. And there's an even sweeter meaning here that is unfortunately not noticeable in English, but it is actually very noticeable in Arabic. It's in Arabic because it's more obvious in Arabic because um, it is singular. So it's, he's saying, I will say to them, you are my people, as opposed to plural, like y'all are my people. <laughs> we don't have that really. In, uh... You are all one person to me. You are all together my betrothed one. So it's, it's an advantage kind of like for those who, uh, because remember we said Lu'ami means you, you are not my people, like or Antum, like y'all are not my, Lestum Shabi. But he says to, to Lestum Shabi, Anta Shabi, you are my people, singular. <clears throat> um, but not only that, then it will not be one-sided anymore. Halas. Then and that day, they too will, will not only reciprocate that betrothal uh, love, but will also view all people as one with them. And they shall say, what? You are our God? No. And they plural, shall say, you are my God, singular. That one you can see it in English. And they shall say, you are my God. If you were typing this in a Word document, one of these will turn red or something. <laughs> Cause, and they shall say, you are our God, or, and he or she shall say, you are my God. So one, of, one or the other. After reading this amazing chapter, if anyone feels missed or not noticed or forgotten by God, what would you tell them? I 
after reading chapter two and seeing the first half, how horrible Gomer has been, <laughs> how horrible the people of Israel have been to God. And then from today, from like verse 14 onward, we see how ridiculously sweet God is to them and how he keeps her soothing. So if anyone feels missed or forgotten or ignored by God, what would you tell them? You are seen and he desires you. You're nicer than me, Michael. <laughs> I tell them, come to and know the my God. Huh? Come to know the Lord. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not saying like to tell them what to do, but like what I'm saying is that if anyone feels missed or forgotten by God, this person has no one to blame by them but themselves. Because obviously he, he can't forget you. He can't miss you. He can't not notice you. He can't. Like He made you. Like you are his. So if you feel that way, then the problem is with you, not with God. So please, don't deprive yourself of this most joyful, most fulfilling, most delightful relationship that you will ever experience. It's not a relationship of I have to. It's a relationship of I really want to. It's the relationship of the betrothed forever. Have you ever gone through yeah. periods of times in your life when you felt like unnoticed or forgotten by God? I, I don't know about y'all, like maybe here in the Bible study, but I, I, I get this a lot from Abuna, what's going on? Why is God ignoring me? Why is God Nasini Lee? Why is he? It's not best. Not a correct understanding. Sorry, Michael, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I mean, yes, you are, you are correct in that. But someone who who is feeling that they're not seen, sometimes they need to be told that they are seen and desired mm -hmm. before they can go ahead and they have to pursue him. Because he's been waiting there. He's waiting there for them. Actually, not just waiting. He's actually pursuing. He's knocking. Behold, yeah, he's knocking on the knock. Door. He's seeking. He's, which need to respond. I would tell them, like, hey, Habibi, you just believe that big old fat lie, a ghastly lie. And I would read Hosea chapter two to them. I think that that should drive it home. Actually, the entire book of Isaiah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, it was mind boggling. We keep seeing like how. They deserve to be hit on, you know, hit on the head with a stick. And then God says, but my hand is stretched out still. Please, please just look at me. Just look at me and I'll do the rest. And and so like I would I would read to them chapter two. Look at how horrible the people are to God and yet how he keeps pursuing and he keeps seeking and he keeps. Um, it's kind of like when a person says that, it's like when a person closes their eyes and they go, the sun is gone so dark the sun has decided not to shine today no <laughs> you know you, you're telling them to read Hosea but at the same time it's if if they read his word on a regular basis there would be no denying that thank you he is pursuing so it's a good point you can't you can't be away from a relationship and then complain <laughs> That God doesn't see you. That's like, you know, locking yourself in a closet and then complaining that your family doesn't notice you. Exactly. Exactly. Or like you can, you can like keep not showing up to dates and not calling your betrothed or your beloved and not spending any time with them, and not talking to them, not anything. And then you go, oh, they forgot me. Hey, like. <laughs> actually, it's more like not returning their messages. There you go. That's actually the more, you know, 
correct way because God is always sending us messages. Yep. He's always speaking to us. Abuna, can I go to, <clears throat> can you go to verse 21? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer. <clears throat> What's the meaning? I will, I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. It's um, basically it's um, he will. It's, it's you know how it says all creation is groaning. All creation is, is crying out to God. Mm -hmm. So the heavens will tell God. God enough. Let's let's have mercy on them. So God will answer oh. the heavens. And so the heavens will give out their rain, the latter rain and the early rain. And so the the ends the heavens will, will answer the earth. It's like the earth is crying out to the heavens, saying we're thirsty, and then the heavens will cry out to God. The heavens oh. aren't gonna give rain without God's permission. And so God will 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 answer. He will respond to the heavens, and the heavens will respond to the earth, and the earth will be nourished and watered. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure. Comments, questions, uh, anything? Yeah. Uh, yes. David, the prophet, David, the psalmist, uh -huh. has this issue. Till where? Till when you forget me, God? Hmm. This is uh, Psalm 12. Psalm 12 says, uh, until when do you forget me, Lord? How, how long will you forget me, Lord? How long will you turn your face away from me? How long will I per put these thoughts in my uh, uh, mind? How long will my enemy prevail over against me? Um, but what's interesting... I mean, the Bible tells us when, when, when God's people mess up, right? So, um, uh, there it is. It says here Psalms 13, but it's, it's Psalm 12 in the Agbeya. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face away from me? How long shall I take counsel in my, take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy rejoice over me? Then look at this. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God, and light to my eyes, lest I sleep till death, lest my enemies say I prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So this is showing us, that's why the Psalms, y'all, are like a beautiful tool to teach us how to pray. He's frustrated, he's angry, he's saying God forgot him. And in the midst of his frustration, he remembered who God is and how he works. And once he remembered this, Allah, now he's saying, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord for he has dealt bountifully with me. He's realizing that it was wrong. Honestly, I'm going to share something with y'all. Whenever I pray this psalm, I don't say those words. I, I have a hard time saying them. I say, when I pray it, I say, how long, O Lord, will I forget you forever? How long will I hide my faith from you? How long shall I take this counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? God, God does not forget us. God does not hide his faith from us. He felt this way. Yes. Exactly. He felt this way, and in the midst of the Psalms, um, you see, so the, the Psalms in general, there's two categories of Psalms, the, the uh, Yada Psalms and the Toda Psalms. The Yada Psalms, like Hind or Yad, means like, when it's, they're basically Psalms of thanksgiving and praises and like, you know, God is great, God is awesome, etc. The Toda Psalms are Psalms that begin where the first half is like, miserable and then somewhere in the middle you'll hear or you will read like but you O lord or but the lord is and then i recalled my god or something like that it mentions god or the lord and then the second half you'll see it completely flips and becomes awesome like really positive 
This is one of the Toda Psalms. Is that because he was, was persecuted by Saul? Uh, I think so. Um, he was escaping from Saul, and uh, he, for a long time, long years, yeah. Then he asked God to wear radio, things like that. But the second half is very comforting, usually. Yeah, if people don't understand what's going on here, or don't notice the that sentence in the middle where, where it says, you know, where he remembers God, um, they will think that King David is like, uh, I don't know, bipolar or something, or because he starts the psalm very sad, very upset, very angry, very frustrated, and then he ends it very happy and rejoicing and thankful and, and grateful. But the magic bullet or the key is that remembering God, remembering his mercy. Check that out. When you read psalms, if they start negatively, just read attentively and, and look for a verse in the middle was going to mention God or the Lord or his mercy or his name or calling on him. And then look at the at how it switches. Are there uh, comments or anything or maybe something you got from today's chapter, today's Bible study? Hi, if I may, um, I just want to... Yani, encourage you all to, uh, as you know, the 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 great fast is coming in a couple of weeks. So we just finished Jonah's fast. Tomorrow is Jonah's Passover. Many happy returns. Um, please, Yanni, take this time to just make a plan or be mindful of what is it that you want to focus on? What is it that you want to do in the great fast? What is it that you're going to fast from? Not just food, but, you know, other stuff. And what is it that you're going to dedicate the extra time that you now have that you've fasted from other stuff to you know to to fill up on good stuff all right let's pray in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit one god i mean the heavenly father god your love is amazing um you're doting on us is overwhelming you're alluring us it makes no sense oh lord Lord, we're sorry for the times that we betray you, for the times that we get stupid and and um, give credit to others or put our eyes on others or call others uh, uh, our lovers. Um, Lord, everything that is good comes from you. Um, even if you send it to us through the hands of others, oh Lord, it is all from you. Help us, oh Lord, to never forget our first love. Help us, O Lord, to figure out ways to always renew our uh, love and zeal and excitement and infatuation and passion of the betrothed and to stay betrothed to you forever. Um, help us, O Lord, to honor your love to us by loving you back. Um, we ask you to please hear us through the intercession of me and always seen some modest who please you from the beginning, through the mighty power of your love, giving cross, and Jonah the prophet, and through the uh, uh, the intercessions or prayers of the Ninevites who repented and uh, fasted and repented and turned from their ways. Please, O oh Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. I mean, and now the love of God, the Father, grace is only begotten Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion, the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. With your spirit. God willing, next time we'll uh, hit uh, Hosea chapter 3. Bye. Thanks, Abuna. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.